Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for EMCA's The Hellenic Revolution, its effects on the American abolitionist movement and beyond panel discussion. Today's event is in association with the Hellenic American National Council, the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce, and the HEPAS Hellenic Cultural Commission. My name is Luke Katsos. I'm the president of EMCA and the chairman of a HEPAS Hellenic Cultural Commission. The distinguished panel for today's uh, unique event will include uh, author, poet, Nicholas Alexiou, professor of sociology and director of the Hellenic American Project at Queens College, who will be speaking on James Williams, Phil Helene, an African-American revolution hero. Author, historian, activist, Herb Boyd, professor of, Black, uh, of the Black Studies program at the City College of New York, CUNY, who will be speaking on the global reach of the Black abolitionist movement. And author, historian, poet, editor, activist, Dan Georgiaklis, the director of the Greek American Studies Project at the Center for Byzantine and Modern Greek Studies at Queens College, who will be speaking on human rights at the turn of the 19th century. I will moderate the panel and uh, also uh, today present on the uh, Hellenic Revolution and its effects on the American abolitionist movement. As mentioned in previous uh, EMCA panel discussions, uh, this discussion will be a further elaboration of my and Professor Alexiou's lecture, which was conducted at uh, Queens College uh, about a year and a half ago, almost two years actually. It was organized by EMCA, uh, Professor Nicholas Alexiou's uh, Hellenic American Project in Queens, and the Black History Month Committee at Queens College. At that time, we spoke on the contributions of African Americans and the Hellenic Revolution of 1821, and early American Philhellenes ushering in the abolitionist and suffrage movements in the United States. A topic on the revolution, the Hellenic Revolution, rarely, if ever, dis ever discussed before that time. This particular panel will focus in more depth on the American abolitionist movement and beyond as influenced by the Hellenic Revolution for Black History Month, uh, which is now in February. And uh, very importantly today, we are also commemorating the anniversary of the assassination of Malcolm X on February 21, 1965 in the Audubon uh, Ballroom in Harlem. In May, we will discuss separately the Hellenic Revolution and its effects on the women's suffrage movement. And important to know for this discussion is that many women uh, at that period were themselves noted abolitionists and activists. Before we start our panel discussion, however, I would like to introduce uh, for a few opening remarks, our associates in this event, Bill Matarangas, the president of the Hellenic American National Council, and uh, Lloyd Williams, the president of the Greater Harlem uh, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Bill, if you can uh, start off uh, with some opening remarks. Uh, thank you for being here and thanking you, thank you for supporting all the various events that we have had uh, this past year uh, relating to the Greek Revolution. Uh, Bill is in Chicago, so we have uh, people in different locations between Bill in Chicago, some in New York, uh, Dan in, uh, in Am Amherst in uh, Massachusetts, and certainly some of our audience who are listening from Greece. Uh, Bill Madarangas. Uh, thank you, my dear, my dear friend, Lou. I'm really, I'm just thinking all this time, thinking of what you were talking about it. And I'd like to thank you first and most of all for inviting me to participate in this, uh, this discussion. And I'd like to say that um, you're second to none what you have done for the community. Uh, all these things, all the work you have done, and I'm honored to the gentleman that's going to participate in this event today, and I'm honored to meet him even through, through the Zoom. I'm the national president, the only umbrella federation in the United States, which is umbrella for the United States, Canada, and Central America. Uh, and we'll be around over 30 years, and our name says it all. We're Hellenic American National Council. We work for a number of issues, most of the ethnic issues, we have participated and we created the biggest rally in Athens 
two years ago, the biggest rally over a million and a half people at the time with the Macedonia issue. We were the only ones who, who managed to pull a permit. I'm from Zakitos, which is, I know you mentioned, you can talk about Filikieteria, um, the little island, which really, that's where everybody got together and sworn in for the, to start the Filikieteria. Uh, I heard a lot of excited things you would talk about today, and I'm going to stay in this whole Zoom. I even saw I was planning to, to go and watch the card like I mentioned to you. <laughs> but I'm honored to, to hear the, everything you got to say because the topic is very interesting. <laughs> and uh, again, I thank you, and I look forward to hear all the other stuff of the speakers that we say and whatever you guys got to say. Thank, thank you, Bill. You've got, you've been a good friend, uh, obviously, all, all these years. Uh, I, I'd you, like sir. now to introduce uh, Lloyd Williams, uh, a very, a very more than a very good friend. Let me put it to you this way: Lloyd, Lloyd, and I go back uh, many years. Um, he, he, he does mention many times that I'm his brother. And I wanna mention it now, certainly to the Hellenic community and those who are listening uh, both in the, in the US and, uh, and in Greece and in Europe also, uh, that Lloyd has been a brother of mine for many, many years. Uh, and uh, we've done a lot of great things together. And I'm, I'm honored that he's here today. Uh, Lloyd Williams, the president of the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Lou. Um, I, I won't take a, a lot of time to uh, repeat what you just said. I, but you know um, your family. Um, your wife Barbara is very close to my wife and I, and you, your son uh, John is uh, my godson. So um, we are truly family. Let me mention uh, the subject matter of the Hellenic Revolution and its effects on uh, the American abolitionist movement and beyond is dramatically appropriate for this time. Of course, it's Black History Month. Um, and uh, then, uh, as you know, and as Herb Boyd knows, today is a very important day to me because it is the day uh, that which uh, addresses the 65th, excuse me, 56th uh, anniversary, 56th anniversary of the assassination of my godfather, um, the Honorable Malcolm X. And uh, uh, February 21st, uh, 1965, my godfather Malcolm X was assassinated. And it is on a today that we celebrate the 56th anniversary of that heinous act. Uh, and so there are a number of things called serendipity that comes together uh, that allows for us to come at the right time. Um, it's very important uh, as people spend so much time trying to divide us around the world and around this nation that we uh, address the things uh, that we have in common. And there's uh, too little knowledge of the uh, connection between the Hellenic Revolution uh, and the American abolitionist movement. So uh, without further ado, I, I thank you on behalf of the Greater Harlem a Chamber of Commerce. I thank you on behalf of my family for the continued partnership and look forward to building on this in the years to come on behalf of Rosa Rivers, our Vice President, and myself. And I, w w I intend to just listen uh, to that which will be taking place during the program, and I'm honored to be a part of it. Thank you, Lloyd. I, I should mention for the audience about uh, five years ago, uh, we did have on the occasion of the uh, anniversary, the 10th anniversary of the, of the death of Archbishop Yakovos and the 50th anniversary on the march uh, on uh, Selma. Uh, we did, did have an event together that brought together a lot of communities, the African-American community, the Greek community, also the Judaic community around those two very important events. Um, and uh, again, I'm, I'm honored that we're here together 
because as you said, there's a, there's a lot between our cultures that's very important for us to know and understand uh, from a historical perspective. And many times uh, we don't mention it enough. People don't talk about it enough. And uh, there are people that always try to divide us, but uh, they will not succeed. Uh, now, I may also mention, Lou, that uh, when you and I talked about it, uh, we recognize, or I recognize, that no one could bring us closer together in this knowledge uh, than uh, the distinguished Herb Boyd, uh, renowned author, professor, uh, and advocate for unity and for people of color. So I'm very glad that Herb Boyd is with us. No, so, so are we. And by the way, uh, Dan and Herb go way back in, the, in Detroit, and hopefully they'll share some of their experiences together uh, uh, with us. Uh, let me give a little bit of background uh, uh, for, for a second before we start uh, some of the presentations. Uh, Costa, if you can, just bring up to the screen, uh, you know, just uh, some slides. Uh, it's very important to understand a little bit about the history of that time period. Uh, uh, it, it, during the Age of Enlightenment, uh, there was uh, certainly an encouragement, uh, you know, for certain ideals like liberty, constitutional government, and all the rest of that that you see on the screen. There were all types of major figures, philosophical figures, uh, who were behind these movements. These are the movements that obviously started various revolutions, including the French Revolution and including the, uh, the US Revolution. Uh, during that, that period also you had uh, wars that took place, uh, which we'll discuss in a second. And around Hellenism, uh, there was, there was a, a period of what they called uh, Hellenomania or Philhellenism that really related to the study of ancient Greece in particular, as it related to uh, certain philosophers, uh, uh, people who have wrote on politics, uh, issues of democracy and things of that nature. So there was a lot of professors who were involved in it. And uh, at the time, uh, for those who may not know, uh, in order to get a university degree, you had to take uh, uh, particular languages and, and Greek was among the requirements uh, of, a, of a college education in the past. Many of the founders uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the US, uh, those who attended college all spoke, uh, all spoke uh, Greek. And in fact, uh, Greek was voted uh, when, when the US had its revolution, they even voted whether Greek should be the language of the United States. They lost, I think, by, by one vote. But during that period, there was also uh, interest in the East with the various, um, European travelers uh, uh, going there. And certainly, uh, and certainly these grand tours, what they call the grand tours uh, were very important uh, as well as all these uh, writings that took place uh, by artists and things of that nature that visited the ancient, uh, the ancient monuments. And that reflected certainly on, on a lot of what was taking place culturally in the West. Uh, next slide, Kosna. When, when the, uh, when the uh, Napoleonic Wars ended, uh, it's very important to understand that uh, everyone in Europe, meaning the major nations that won the Napoleonic Wars, England, etc., did not want to have anything to do with revolutions. So even when the Greek Revolution broke out, no nation, no nation wanted to support the Greek Revolution. That doesn't mean that the people of these various nations were, were not interested in supporting the revolution, but no nation wanted to support another revolution in, in Europe. And certainly they did not, not want to support a revolution against the Ottoman Empire, which we'll discuss in a second. There was only one nation. And when the Greek revolution broke out, uh, they sent, they sent uh, you know, through, through various intellectuals, one of them being Corais, who was in France at the time, who was a very good friend of, of for example, Jefferson, uh, to send out letters throughout the world to have people try to support uh, the Greek revolutionaries. There was only one nation that supported the, uh, the Greek revolution, and that was the, the nation of Haiti, the nation of Haiti because they understood, they understood what uh, slavery was all about. They had their own revolution and they were the first supporters. The US actually did not support uh, the Hellenic revolution until after the revolution was over. 
around 1833 was about the timeline. In other words, about three, three years after. And, uh, and that relates to a few things that we'll discuss. One of them had to do with, uh, with trade that uh, US uh, merchants were doing with the Ottoman Empire at the time. And it certainly had a lot to do with the, uh, with the opium trade in particular, where opium was bought in, uh, in um, the Ottoman Empire and then sold for uh, tremendous amounts in, the, uh, in China. Uh, next slide, uh, question. This is uh, the Ottoman Empire at the period around the revolution. In this particular case, uh, 1817, the revolution itself broke out in, 18, in 1821. Understand that the uh, Ottoman Empire was a huge empire. It, uh, it not only in incorporated Greece, which is towards the north, but all the Balkans, all the way close to, uh, to Vienna, and certainly what is now the modern nation of, uh, of Turkey, uh, the Middle East the, the, as we know it, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, the whole African coast. So this was a, a major empire at the time period. Next slide, please. This, uh, this shows the various composition of the different people of the Ottoman Empire. And what you see in blue uh, is the Orthodox or the Rooms. So when we talk about the Hellenic Revolution, it's, it's the people in the blue. Notice that the people in the blue are related to not only Greece, but also the Balkans. Uh, what is now also Turkey, because uh, obviously there was a lot of uh, Greeks in Turkey, and also also in Egypt and throughout throughout the Middle East. Next slide, please. One of the uh, one of the uh, people of the Enlightenment, one of the uh, uh, significant people within uh, the Enlightenment, uh, someone who preached revolution was Ligas Fereus, very famous in Greek history, and this is just a, an excerpt from one of his uh, uh, treatises. And he said, better an hour of life that is free than 40 years of slavery. Uh, next slide, please. When the revolution broke out, uh, again, as I said, no nation supported, supported the, uh, the Greek revolution in Europe. And as a matter of fact, they restricted their citizens from going into, going into Greece to fight in the revolution. Many nations uh, were involved in it. Their people actually, and a lot of them, uh, like in America, they, they had what they call Greek committees. Uh, usually they started at the university level and many people went to for, uh, fight. Uh, they were from Germany, from France, from Italy, uh, throughout the world and including the United States of America. Next slide, please. One of the, one of the, uh, the great uh, heroes, let's say, of the Greek revolution and who was, who was the rock star, he was the absolute rock star of that particular age was Lord Byron. And Lord Byron, I think more than anyone else in the uh, outside of Greece uh, affected the revolution and the way it was perceived by the West. Uh, here he is in uh, Greek dress. Uh, he did leave uh, uh, England. Uh, he did come to fight for the revolution. Uh, he did uh, die in Greece uh, around the time period of, uh, of the Battle of Mesolongi. And again, uh, someone who was tremendously influential in getting a lot of uh, people to get behind the revolution. Next slide, please. This is taken from one of his works uh, where he talks about, uh, I think this is from uh, Child Harold's Pilgrimage, which was an early uh, work that he, uh, that he did when he was in the court of Ali Pasha, uh, when Greece was uh, uh, obviously before the revolution. And this is just a you know, quote from him, the mountains uh, look on Marathon and Marathon looks at the sea and musing there an hour alone, I dreamed that Greece might be free. Next. Next slide. This, is ex this particular slide is very important uh, in terms of American history, but also European history. And it has to do with the Barbary Wars, the Barbary Wars. <clears throat> the United States, uh, uh, which was trading in Europe and other nations, uh, had to contend with uh, the, the, the Barbary pirates. Uh, the pirates controlled, obviously, the, uh, the Mediterranean uh, towards the west. And as people were trying to go into the Ottoman Empire to do their trades, like I was indicating, their ships would be raided. In many, many cases, their sailors would be, uh, would be enslaved and held for ransom. And this prior to the Hellenic Revolution created a very negative effect within the United States in particular 
uh, relating to the Ottoman Empire of that period. Uh, especially it, it highlighted the aspect of, uh, of slavery uh, uh, within, uh, within Greece at the time period. And when we talk about slavery, understand that the, uh, the Byzantine Empire fell in uh, 1453 uh, uh, or the 15th century, 1453. And from 1453 to 1821, when the revolution uh, uh, broke out, uh, they were under the Ottoman Empire and everyone in the empire uh, was a slave. When we talk about slaves, understand that it wasn't only that the Greeks were slaves, but everyone within the Ottoman Empire were slaves, not only Christians, but also Muslims. In other words, the Muslims were also slaves to the Sultan. So it was a period again of, uh, of slavery. And if we go back to the quote that was from Rigas Fereos, you understand that there was this this thing of revolution. Prior to the revolution, the Greek revolution of 1821, there were multiple revolutions from 1453. In other words, it wasn't just one revolution, it was constant revolutions uh, that, were, that were always put, put out. It was the revolution of 1821 that was the one that was successful and they finally got their liber uh, liberty. Uh, I think that's the last slide, right, uh, Kostin? Okay. No, one more slide. Uh, here are some of the uh, American Philhellenes that, uh, that uh, joined the revolution. Uh, in particular, uh, within America, obviously, you had very large supporters. You had Jefferson, you had Madison, you had Monroe, uh, Henry Clay, uh, Everett, uh, Professor Everett, who was the classics professor at Harvard. He was the one that started these Greek committees, and uh, they took off like wildfire in the United States. Uh, the ne next list is some of the uh, people who fought from the United States uh, in Greece uh, for the revolution. One of them was George Jar uh, Jarvis, who was known as Capitan Zervos uh, in, uh, in Greece. Uh, he spoke, he ended up speaking the Greek language, dre dressing as a Greek, and uh, certainly was one of, was an adjunct to some of the foremost uh, uh, commanders uh, in Greece. You had ca uh, Captain, later Colonel Jonathan Miller of Vermont. And uh, Lucas Miller, uh, who he adopted, or one of the orphans, uh, became the first Hellenic American uh, congressperson in the United States. You had the famous uh, Dr. Samuel Howe of Boston. Uh, he, he went to Greece as a surgeon, established a, a hospital. He, in the United States, he created the Perkins School of the Blind. And uh, he adopted John Zachos, uh, uh, who became a professor and also the chief librarian at Cooper Union. I'll discuss them a little bit later including Jonathan Miller as abolitionists. We also had uh, George uh, uh, Wilson of Providence. Uh, we had James uh, Williams, the African-American free slave of Baltimore who fought and died in Nafpaktos and is buried in Greece. And we had even one of the relatives of, uh, of George Washington, William Washington, who fought and died in Greece and, uh, and uh, uh, died in Palamidi, in the Battle of Palamidi. Uh, next slide, uh, if there is one. Okay, good. So let me uh, just begin. Uh, American Phil, uh, Philhellenism by uh, 1821, when a Hele Hellenic revolution broke out, although derived from European origins, became more than just a philosophical uh, movement. It caught America by storm and is referred to as the Greek fever, the Greek fire historically in United States history. It was influenced and inspired in part by America's contact with the Ottoman Empire and the Barbary states that I mentioned earlier, but also from their missionary and commercial interests, which led to the first military conflicts abroad relating to the Barbary Wars. America's first wars were the Barbary Wars uh, for those, for those uh, who are for the audience. America also knew Hellenes as slaves in the East and also as fellow warriors in America's first battle and victory on foreign soil, which was the Battle of Derma in 1805. When we talk about, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, the US Marines and the song that they sing uh, relating to uh, the line, the shores of Tripoli, they were, it, it talks about uh, in that song, the Battle of Dharma, uh, where US Marines and Greek mercenaries fought against the Ottoman Empire and actually won the first Barbary Wars with that particular battle. 
When the uh, Hellenic Revolution broke out and through the efforts of many in the United States, Greek committees were formed rapidly to support and, and finan financially. And in some cases, Americans went to fight as we indicated. We talked about uh, George Jarvis, for example, Captain uh, Jonathan Miller. Uh, we talked about Samuel Gridley Howell, who became the chief uh, surgeon of the Greek uh, Navy. And certainly uh, George Wilson and James Williams, uh, the African-American slave uh, from uh, Baltimore. James Williams uh, left the United States and, and went, in fact, fought in the Barbary Wars before he, before he fought in the, uh, in the Greek Revolution. And those are among some of those that fought uh, from the United States. Uh, many who fought in Greece and, and uh, others who were members of the Greek committees became and were serious abolitionists in America and significant opponents of uh, American slavery. And they included uh, some of the people I mentioned and which I'll go into more details a little bit later. Uh, we will explore uh, some of them uh, in this discussion, as well as the Hellenes who came back to the US in some cases uh, as orphans from the revolution and themselves became uh, American abolitionists and uh, many of them who fought in the uh, US Civil War. Uh, we hope uh, that this discussion and conversation contributes to a wave of research and, con and continuing discussions on this very important topic. And we're very pleased, quite frankly, uh, that other organizations uh, are, have picked up on some of the things that we have been doing with some of our lectures on the uh, Greek Revolution. And, uh, and we're, uh, we're very pleased uh, with the fact that they themselves are having various events around the things that we have discussed. I would like to introduce our, uh, our first uh, presenter. Uh, this is uh, Professor Nicholas Alexio, who will speak on James Williams, Phil Helene, and African-American Hellenic Revolution hero. Nicholas Alexio was born in Volos, Greece, where he studied economics. He received his, uh, his MA degree in sociology and a PhD uh, from the Graduate Center of, uh, of CUNY. He has taught in the Department of Sociology at Queens College since uh, 1990 and has received the President's Award for Excellence in Teaching. His fields of interest are social and political sociology, ethnic studies, and research. He has established the first archive library museum for Greeks of New York, and he is the director of research of the Hellenic American Project at Queens College. Also a contemporary poet, he is the author of six books of poetry, and many of his poems have been published in Greek and American journals and anthologies. He is a member of the Greek Authors Association in Greece and the Greek American Writers Guild Association in New York. Uh, uh, Nicholas, welcome and thank you. Lou, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I want uh, uh, to thank uh, all uh, the members of this uh, distinguished uh, panel. Uh, I'm very honored to be uh, a small part uh, of this. Uh, uh, I'm very uh, happy to, to see that um, the efforts um, to uh, commemorate uh, both uh, the, uh, the Greek uh, War of, of Independence and also uh, Black History Month uh, coincide once more and is very, very important. Uh, as far as concern, um, uh, the contribution of, of American Philhellenes. Uh, it, it is very important in many, in many ways. Uh, definitely one is uh, the, the actuality of the issue that some people, although it was a small group of volunteers who, who went to Greece and fight, but also the role uh, of uh, the American press to keep the Greek cause uh, into, um, uh, you know, very high in the everyday agenda of uh, the American nation and also around the world. So it was a tremendous, tremendous contribution. As far as concern uh, American uh, uh, philhellism, uh, I see it uh, in three, uh, uh, it is important in three uh, uh, fundamental uh, uh, forms. First of all, it was expressed as a, as a, ma as a massive and dynamic movement within the United States. Uh, in the form of uh, public speeches, fundraising, medical supplies, food, clothing, um, aid of any kind. Uh, 
also uh, in literature, a lot of poetry was written up at, at, that, uh, at that time. Um, another uh, thing that we can see is uh, the enthusiasm, the enthusiasm of, of the movement uh, in Greece. Uh, by, you can see that by the formation of the various American Philhellenic committees, uh, all kinds of philanthropy uh, and uh, uh, activism, missionaries, etc. And of course, uh, uh, as you mentioned, Lou, the direct participation in the war of, of independence. A, a small, small group of uh, 14, 16 people were ex extremely important. Uh, we, we have uh, in, in America and in New York in particular, um, uh, public uh, documents, uh, the, the committee uh, of, uh, of the Greek fund of the, of the city of New York uh, in 1823. We, we also have um, uh, a, a renaming of a city uh, in New York, in Northern uh, uh, New York State. Uh, the, the, the town of Greece, <coughs> which was established in 1822, it was uh, previously called um, uh, Northampton, and uh, they acquired the name Greece, uh, uh, selected uh, because of the struggle of Greece uh, for its uh, independence. So we see this uh, uh, fundamental uh, and, and important uh, contribution. Um, the yeah. Among, among this small group of, of American uh, uh, volunteers to the, to the Greek fight, the Greek war, uh, is one very interesting case, and uh, at the same time, very unknown case. It is, it is the case of, of, of James uh, uh, William. Uh, we know very little things about him, and uh, we hope we continue our, our research finding more. Uh, until now, we know that James Williams uh, um, I uh, was a, a slave in, in Baltimore. Uh, he managed to, to, uh, to, to free himself and join the American Navy under the command of the Admiral uh, Stefan Decatur, uh, who sailed uh, to the Mediterranean Sea and, as you said, um, to the Barbary Wars, especially the Second Barbary War. Um, which uh, The Barbary Wars actually were the first uh, uh, wars of America uh, outside of the United States, a uh, very significant uh, 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 period at that time. Uh, he was, um, he was um, uh, recorded, he, it is documented that he was uh, 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 in, 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 this, in this adventure uh, in, um, as a cook. Uh, as far as concern uh, Greece, we, we, we find him, we find, we find evidence about James Williams uh, uh, from uh, 1822, very early uh, in the revolution, uh, until his death in 1827. Uh, he took place, he took part in the liberation of Athens. And, uh, you know, uh, Lou has as, as a background the Acropolis and uh, definitely uh, uh, James Williams, uh, uh, was there in 1822 uh, around the, the, the Acropolis taking part in the liberation of Athens. Um, he comes in contact with uh, other American philelines who were there, Javris, Howe, etc. And um, uh, with that, he, he enlisted himself to the uh, um, battalion of uh, the philelines. Uh, and he, he, he took part in, uh, in, in the Battle uh, of Peta in 1822, in June. Uh, of course, uh, because uh, the majority of the Philhellenes of that early period, uh, where uh, they, they weren't uh, experienced uh, uh, fighters, um, the majority of them was destroyed. Um, uh, of course, uh, 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 James uh, Williams himself, he had experience, uh, he, he, he escaped, and we find evidence again uh, uh, about him uh, uh, with um, uh, take, taking part in the, in, in the siege of uh, Misologi uh, um, <clears throat> from the journals of, uh, of, um, of um, uh, Javris and, and, and others. Uh, uh, we see uh, that an entry saying that um, next next to uh, to, to Byron uh, uh, was uh, 
uh, an African American who assumed that that uh, was uh, James Williams, who fought. Uh, <coughs> in the seeds of, of, of misology. Misology was an extremely important incident. It took uh, an international attention uh, in their famous paintings uh, around the world, particularly one from Delacroix, uh, the Greece uh, and, and the ruins of misology that gave um, uh, another international attention uh, to, to the Greek cause. After the third decision of, of mythology uh, and um, his um, uh, its heroic and terrifying uh, fall, James Williams appears again uh, with the fleet of uh, the Greek admiral uh, Miaoulis, Andreas uh, Miaoulis, in the island of Hydra, and he fights in many uh, naval uh, battles. The final events uh, of his life take place during the Battle of Navarino, which was an international. Uh, 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 operation. Uh, it was uh, the United uh, uh, um, uh, Naval uh, Fleet of, of the Great Powers against the, the uh, Turco Egypt uh, um, fleet. And it was a, a massive victory uh, of the Allies against uh, the Ottoman uh, um, Empire. Uh, he, he's, uh, he's enlisted in, on the ship Carteria, uh, which means. Um, uh, Perseverance, uh, which was the first powered uh, warship to be used in, in combat uh, operation. Uh, he was wounded badly in that battle and uh, he finds himself in the island of Poros where the other uh, great Philhellene, uh, Dr. Howe, he had established the first uh, uh, hospital and uh, he tried to uh, cure him. Um, we have um, an entry. Um, of um, a war journal of the Colonel uh, Miller. Uh, uh, the entry is at December 21st, uh, 1927, where he writes about James Williams. I went uh, to our hospital and took James Williams from Baltimore to my home. Williams came to Greece with Lord Cochrane and served as a cook on the Sauveur. Cool and fearless in difficult times, he surpassed himself in the Battle of Lepanto. Uh, we know just Nafpaktos now. Uh, thus honoring our place and our navy, because in moments when no Greek had the courage to take the helm in his hands, Williams willingly he did, and there he was found by the bullet that broke his leg and his arm. So this is the entry by, uh, by Miller about the, the last uh, days and hours of uh, uh, um, James Williams. Um, uh, two years ago, uh, I managed to find a place uh, of, of rest of Williams. It is in, in a Greek church in, in, in Argos, along uh, with Javris. Unfortunately, there is not um, uh, uh, a memorial uh, uh, to him uh, specifically, and after discussions with uh, with uh, Lukatsos and uh, uh, the various organizations he 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 represents, it was uh, a decision, a very serious decision, to um, um, erect a, a monument, a memorial uh, to, to to his name. But unfortunately, the pandemic has pushed uh, every everything uh, everything back. I hope soon uh, uh, we'll have a chance to. Um, um, reinstate that. Uh, also, I want to mention that the Greek American community, as particular uh, the Cypriot community, has established for many, many years now uh, an award, um, uh, which is called uh, uh, after the name of James Williams. And uh, two of the most famous recipients of that award was uh, uh, Senator then Obama. And, and, uh, and the most recent one was um, Kamala Harris, uh, when um, she received the James Williams Award um, in, in a conference in June of uh, 2019. So I am pleased that the Greek American community at least has uh, done and will continue uh, to, to, to uh, further to have a, 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 a vision to, to establish uh, 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 the great and recognize uh, widely uh, the contribution of an African American to the to the Greek War of Independence. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Nico. And before before I introduce uh, Professor Herb Boyd, 
I just like to go uh, a little bit uh, deeper into the uh, in the revolution and its effects on the American abolitionist movement. Uh, public support for the uh, American Hellenic Revolution uh, contributed to the creation of early anti-slavery societies and women's rights organizations. When it first emerged, um, the Greek uh, cause was supported by local community-based organizations. The cause brought Americans together and became intertwined with the popular notions of early American patriotic identity. By the end of the 1820s, which is the end uh, towards the end of the revolution, however, the issue of uh, slavery inspired some American uh, men and women to draw connections between the condition of women and slaves in their own country and the conditions of the Hellenes who they supported uh, you know, during the uh, revolutionary war against the Ottoman Empire. Appropriating the issue of slavery and denigration of Hellenes from Phil Hellenes, anti-slavery supporters and women rights advocates employed similar rhetoric to develop their own causes. By the end of the 1820s, American advocates for abolition of, women, of uh, slavery and women's rights, such as David Walker, William uh, Lloyd uh, Garrison, Emma Willard, themselves evoked uh, references to the Greek War of Independence and Ottoman slavery in arguing uh, for slavery's eradication and improvement in the status of women in the United States. Long after the Hellenic War of Independence had ended uh, in uh, 1830, the American abolitionists employed the ideas and tactics of the Philhellenic movement that was taking place earlier with the Greek uh, committees that we discussed, engaging new audiences on the question of slavery and spurring interest in the notion also of women's rights. Philhellenic enthusiasm and the popularity of American captivity tales from the Barbary Wars uh, com uh, composed the general attitude Americans had towards the Ottoman Empire, which was not a positive one, at the beginning of the Hellenic Revolution. But few Americans at the beginning of the Greek Revolution connected the dots uh, relating, uh, for example, to African uh, slavery in America and to the subjugated uh, condition uh, of, the modern, of the modern Hellenes. As a, as a matter of fact, uh, both in the North and the South, both in the North and the South, they supported the Greek revolution with issues uh, of, of revolving around the issue of slavery. And in the South in particular, not, not getting it that, uh, that they were holding people under, under captivity. After a few years, there, were, there was a distinctive shift in which anti-slavery and women's rights advocates began to use American support for the Hellenic revolution to point out the lack of interest in supporting uh, such issues in the United States. As I indicated in the beginning, Northerners and Southerners agreed on the importance of the cause, despite the fact that the issue of slavery within the, within the United States had become a major topic of debate. The Greek cause, the Greek cause and the Greek revolution remained separate from the debates over the domestic issues of slavery until again, the 1820s, when the abolitionist movement uh, shifted, as I indicated. Then sectional tensions uh, proved to be so volatile that even the, uh, the unity that the Northerners and Southerners shared for their affection of the ancient Greeks and the modern descendants did not last any longer. Uh, since Philhellenic uh, efforts had proven so successful, uh, more marginally popular causes of the time began to draw from the rhetoric of the Greek cause for their own purposes. Uh, pamphlets uh, on these topics especially be began to emerge in the United States in 1825 uh, when the Greek cause uh, enjoyed renewed interest after Byron's death and the fall of Messalonghi that was mentioned earlier uh, by Professor Alexiou. Authors identified the paradox of seeking to free the Greeks from the Ottoman slavery while, in, while enslaving African-Americans in their own country. With the enthusiasm for the Greek cause at an all time high uh, by 1830, abolitionists began to, to see the value of using 
philhellenic rhetoric for their own purposes. African-American publications referenced the Greek Revolution and appealed to their readers to recognize the similarity between the life of a Greek under Ottoman rule and the life of an African-American slave uh, uh, in the South. Several articles were published in the uh, first African-American newspaper, Freedom's Journal, at the height of the Greek causes popularity relating to those similarities. Uh, African-American abolitionist David Walker, for example, used the Greek cause as a rhetorical tool in his, in his, uh, in his pamphlets. Uh, appeal to the colored uh, uh, citizens of the world, which the pamphlet was named, uh, uh, which rallied both free and enslaved African-Americans to stand up against the institution of slavery. Walker contrasted the Hellenic Revolution and the widespread support of it in the United States. Uh, and again, with the lack of interest in, in eradicating slavery uh, in, the, in the South. Perhaps the, the, uh, the most famous uh, non-African-American abolitionist, William Lloyd Garrison, at a very early age became uh, a pro-Greek in terms of uh, the fervor that was taking place at that time with many, with many youths. And he aspired, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, at one point to, to, to do, defend the Greeks actually by joining the Greek, uh, the Greek army himself. Uh, Philhellenic rhetoric stayed with Garrison throughout his life and uh, made many appearances in his abolitionist writing. Uh, in uh, his mind, his desire for freedom and abolition of slaves in the United States was the same as, uh, as the Greeks. Garrison continued through time to use Philhellenic rhetoric as part of anti-slavery arguments. In 1831, uh, he openly accused his countrymen of being hypocrites for supporting the Greeks while forsaking African slaves. Attempting to turn this argument around uh, you know, on his readers, Garrison reminded them uh, that they had all applauded when, uh, when the uh, Greek insurrection took place against the Ottomans. But then he asked, and I quote, where is the difference between such a cause and our own? Garrison's uh, uh, Philhellenic uh, revolution comparison was a constant rhetorical tool against, uh, against American slavery. I'd like uh, also for the, for, for the audience, uh, in particular, some of this material, which is, uh, again, not widely ever discussed, has come up recently in a lot of, uh, a lot of writing. Uh, I'm proud to announce that uh, one of the writers uh, of, of a new book that came out in December, and we had her on one of our, one of our uh, lecture series with regards to Hellenic and Philhellenic women in the uh, Greek Revolution, and that's Professor Maureen Santelli. Uh, she has written a book called The Greek Fire, which came out in December. Uh, it outlines these points in specificity, and uh, I've used uh, some of her quotes actually in putting uh, the material uh, together today. And I suggest for those who are very interested, not only in uh, the abolitionist movement, but also in the women's suffrage movement, uh, to pick up this book, The Greek Fire by Professor Maureen Santelli. Uh, Costa, if you can, uh, let's uh, just so show some quick slides. Uh, and I'm just gonna mention a few abolitionists, uh, some of the names I've already discussed. And I'm just going to mention a, a few of those abolitionists, not the ones in America, but Americans who actually fought in the Greek Revolution and also some of the orphans who came from Greece uh, you know, and, uh, and or refugees who came from Greece uh, who became abolitionists. One of the famous abolitionists uh, and one of the most famous Philhellenes who fought in Greece, extremely well known in Greece and uh, considered the Lafayette of the Greek Revolution was Samuel Gridley Howe. Uh, he was a 19th century American physician, abolitionist, advocate for the education of the blind, and I, as I indicated, he was the first director of the uh, Perkins Institute, uh, which he founded. Uh, he was born in Boston uh, when he graduated from Brown and later uh, he graduated from uh, Harvard Medi Medical School and took his degree there and became certified to practice uh, medicine. He was enthused about what was happening in Greece, in particular relating to his idol, uh, Lord Byron. And he decided to just leave uh, right after uh, you know, medical school went to Greece, joined the Greek uh, military, the army, and became a surgeon. And later he was the chief surgeon of the Hellenic uh, uh, Navy. 
Uh, his services uh, went beyond the call of duty. Again, very famous uh, individual. Uh, and uh, he was very influential in the Greek committees of the United States in terms of raising, helping raise money. He stayed in Greece over the war, fought the war, went back to America, raised funds, brought supplies uh, to, uh, to, uh, to Greeks uh, who were, uh, quite frankly, uh, torn apart in terms of the war that took place. It was a, it was a, savage, it was a savage war on both, on both sides, quite frankly. Many people were, were killed. But American supplies did, in fact, help save many, many Greeks uh, uh, during the revolution. When he came uh, back to the U.S., uh, he, he did bring with him a couple of a few refugees uh, and, uh, and orphans. Uh, uh, two of them became uh, pro uh, prominent abolitionists and women's rights activists. Uh, one was John Zarcos and the other one was uh, Christophoros Castanis, uh, among others. Uh, and uh, we'll discuss some of them in, in terms of our, dis our discussion. Uh, Frederick Douglass, obviously, and many uh, other members of the, uh, of the abolitionist movement were people that he was very uh, familiar with, uh, had many discussions with. Uh, and uh, although uh, an early abolitionist, he, he entered publicly into the anti-slave slavery struggle for the first time in 1846. Uh, when he ran as a candidate for Congress. He was one of the founders of the anti-slavery newspaper, the Boston Daily Commonwealth, which he edited with the assistance of his wife, uh, Julia Ward Howe, who herself is a famous abolitionist, as well as a very famous uh, writer and woman and, uh, and women suffrage uh, 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 proponent. He was a member of the Kansas Committee in Massachusetts, uh, you know, with, uh, with uh, Franklin uh, Sanborn, uh, George Luther Stearns, uh, Theodore Parker, and Jared Smith. He assisted uh, John Brown in his attack on, um, on Harper's Ferry. Uh, he and the committee, he was one of the secret six that they talk about. Uh, he helped fund actually, as I said, uh, John Brown and uh, after John Brown got arrested, uh, Howe decided to flee for a, for a limited period of time uh, to Canada to escape prosecution. Uh, he continued uh, with regards to his uh, abolitionist uh, um, activities. Uh, he vehemently opposed the fugitive slave law. He and Theodore Parker in uh, 1854, another abolitionist, stormed Faneuil Hall by battering down the door in order to free a captured escaped slave, Anthony uh, Burns, who was going to be sent back to uh, his slave owner in uh, Virginia in accordance with the fugitive slave law. Uh, during that incident, uh, a deputy was accidentally shot and the, the ensuing fracas and uh, was only put, a, put, a, put down finally when federal troops uh, put an end to the event. He and the other men, uh, men however, uh, did not abandon Burns. Uh, they uh, did raise the money to purchase his freedom uh, from the slave owner uh, within a year. And I can continue with all the various uh, different events, uh, you know, that, uh, and examples of what, what he did as an abolitionist. Uh, during the Civil War, uh, he was appointed to the American Freedmen's Inquiry uh, Commission and traveled both to the uh, Deep South and to Canada to investigate uh, the uh, condition of emancipated slaves. He and his wife uh, actually also were uh, part of the Underground Railroad and, uh, and uh, had slaves go through the house and, uh, and to be uh, ushered into Canada for uh, before obviously the Civil War. Uh, and uh, in his account uh, that, that he did for the, uh, for the Freedmen's Inquiry Commission, uh, called the Refugees from Slavery in Canada West. Uh, that report contributed to the passage of the law establishing the Freedmen's Bureau, uh, uh, considered needed to aid uh, uh, Southern uh, uh, free slaves in transition. At the close of the Civil War, he, he continued his work with the Bureau and the extension of the work uh, and was, an, it was an extension of his abolitionist activities. Uh, he helped feed, that bureau helped feed, clothe, educate, provide medical care uh, to newly freed slaves in the South after the Civil War. And we can go on. Uh, let's go to the next, the next slide. By the way, how, how is important in many ways, and we are going to have another event relating to him because he was also a doctor and he did a lot of very important things 
as a medical doctor, including helping the blind. Uh, uh, certainly when we talked about, uh, you know, the, the institute that he founded, uh, that's where we get Helen Keller and all the rest of them who were, who were taught Braille. And, and uh, again, we'll discuss that at another, at another event. Um, so uh, this is a, a photo of the, uh, of the, what they call the secret six who supported and financed uh, uh, John Brown and, uh, and certainly uh, Howe was one of their, uh, one of the leaders of that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Julia, Julia Ward uh, in her own right, even, even though we put her next to, next to Samuel Gridley, she was uh, an, an extremely important person uh, historically, uh, an abolitionist, uh, uh, one of the founders of the women's suffrage movement. Uh, she's best known in the, in the U.S. For the, uh, for the Battle Hymn of the Republic, which she wrote. Uh, but uh, she is uh, an extremely well-known, famous person. And there is a book recently that came out uh, about her. During, during the period that we're talking about, uh, Samuel Gridley Howe was uh, maybe more well-known than his wife. But today his wife is probably more well-known than he is. Next slide, please. Another, another one of the, uh, another one of the uh, uh, people who fought in the uh, Greek Revolution was Colonel uh, uh, Jonathan Miller that I indicated earlier. And he, uh, he was known in the United States actually as an abolitionist. They, when, you, when you look at uh, some of the literature on him, you'll find him as an abolitionist, but he was extremely important uh, as, uh, as a, a Greek revolutionary uh, fighter in Greece. Uh, you know, after his mil military training, uh, during the uh, 1812 war, and after he joined the U.S. Army, he, uh, he did go to Greece to fight. Uh, and uh, he was very famous in terms of bravery. And there he earned the title of colonel and, uh, and returned to the U.S. again, just like Samuel Gridley Howe did, uh, and raised a lot of money uh, uh, for the cause. Uh, in uh, Vermont, uh, the state that he came from, uh, he did uh, become, uh, uh, he did, uh, run for the legislator, he did become a lawyer. Uh, he and his wife also uh, uh, sheltered slaves uh, uh, and uh, escaping in the Underground Railroad. And the Millers helped the Underground financially and they would ferry escapees uh, using stagecoaches. Uh, in the legislature, he, uh, he uh, favored uh, abolitionist causes. And uh, one of his resolutions in 1833 uh, related uh, to uh, senators uh, to promote anti-slavery. Uh, Vermont was uh, possibly the most abolitionist of the Northern American states during that time period. And the 1840 legislature there uh, declared the fugitive slaves were entitled to a trial by jury. Uh, this measure unfortunately was overturned by the Supreme Court, but uh, Vermont responded uh, with its own uh, countermeasures. This photo that I have over here uh, relates to the uh, World Anti-Slavery Convention in London. And Miller, uh, Miller who is again uh, himself uh, uh, part of an organization, uh, you know, with uh, Wendell Phillips, uh, William Lloyd Garrison, and Samuel May, uh, they, uh, they were obviously, uh, all of these people that we have mentioned were obviously people who were dealing with each other in the abolitionist movements. But Miller uh, was uh, selected in America to go to the World Anti-Slave Convention in London in 1840. Uh, this photo is of that, uh, is of that convention. And uh, again, uh, Miller, although he died before the, uh, the Civil War, uh, he was a you know, tremendous supporter uh, to his dying day in terms of uh, abolitionist movements. Uh, next photo, please. I'm just gonna, again, go quickly because I, I, I'm taking too much time, but this, this topic is, is like extremely important. And I think we should mention uh, some of the participants. We can't mention them all because there's too many of them. But some of the refugees and orphans uh, who came from Greece, uh, uh, themselves, uh, uh, who were who were who were slaves within Greece, uh, came to the U.S. and became active members uh, of the abolitionist movement. One of them was uh, Photius uh, Kalivergos, who we have here. He was adopted by uh, Fisk. Uh, another one was uh, John Zakos. 
they were both uh, orphans who were rescued, uh, you know, uh, by uh, the American Philhellenes and brought to the United States uh, to be educated. Another one that we don't have a photo of right now is Joseph uh, Stefaninis, uh, who was another refugee who came to the United States through the financial assistance of the Greek Committee uh, in New York. In the US, he wrote a memoir in which he condemned American slavery and encouraged Americans to see the similarity between the institution of slavery uh, in America and the conflict that persisted within the Ottoman Empire and, uh, and those slaves. Uh, he had obviously a unique perspective because he himself was a slave and uh, he understood slavery uh, firsthand. Uh, his, uh, his father, his family was captured by the Ottomans. Uh, his father was killed. Uh, his family was sold into slavery. And he served several years as a captive. And uh, when, he, when he did come to the US uh, uh, after escaping his captors and, and gaining passage on an American ship, uh, he was taken under the wing of the, uh, of the Greek Committee of New York. And uh, he became in a way a representative of the Greek Committee. And uh, it, you know, he was taken around basically and you know, expressed his experiences. Uh, in, in, uh, in Greece as a, as a slave. And, and certainly what was, um, what was pivotal in his mind regarding American slavery uh, was when he visited the South and he saw slavery, the institution of slavery in the South and it, and it, furthered, it furthered his abolitionist uh, beliefs. Uh, with, the, uh, with the help of, uh, of various uh, uh, Philhellenes, both in New York, Philadelphia and in Boston, uh, again, uh, they supported uh, his um, going around the U.S. and speaking on these on these uh, on these issues. Another one uh, that we uh, uh, that we talked about uh, in terms of um, abolitionists was uh, Fortius Fisk. Okay, he came. Uh, let's go back to the Fortius Fisk. Uh, just one one back, of uh, course. Like that. He came to the U.S. under the sponsorship of the uh, American Board of Missions. Uh, as well as other uh, Phil Hellenes. Uh, again, he was, uh, uh, he was uh, an orphan. He was adopted by, uh, by Fisk, who was a, a very wealthy American. He was educated in the United States. And he became an ordained minister and was named a chaplain in the US Navy in uh, 1841. And he frequently worked and conversed with officers uh, who owned slaves. And, and that furthered his, his, uh, his abolitionist uh, beliefs. Uh, he decided uh, to take it as a cause in a very serious way. And uh, his work uh, uh, through uh, uh, various philanthropic causes uh, gained uh, national recognition within the United States uh, relating to uh, the anti-slavery movement and the, uh, the abolition of slavery in, in the United States. Uh, he became very well acquainted, uh, as did others that I mentioned, because they all, they all knew each other. Uh, with William Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips, uh, Frederick Douglass, uh, and many other members, including uh, included in the uh, Afri in the uh, anti-slavery movement, including John uh, John Brown. He also contributed a hundred dollars to the uh, John Brown mission. Uh, John uh, Zachos, we can go back to the John Zachos. Uh, yeah, John Zachos also became uh, you know, an ardent abolitionist. Again, he was also one of the orphans that we had talked about earlier, and he was under uh, Samuel Gridley Howe's uh, care. Uh, his, his father uh, was killed in front of his eyes, actually, during, during the revolution. And, uh, and he came as a, as a young man uh, with Samuel Gridley Howe when he returned to the US uh, to be educated. Zachos, uh, besides his, uh, his um, abolitionist movement aspects, is an extremely famous American orator. And uh, later on in life, uh, he, was, he was a friend of uh, Cooper. And, uh, and if people remember, one of the most famous speeches that Abraham Lincoln made was at Cooper Union. And uh, John Zachos later was actually the chief librarian at Cooper Union. And it was a Cooper Union speech that uh, helped propel uh, Abraham uh, Lincoln uh, to uh, to become a serious candidate to run for the presidency and eventually uh, winning the uh, the presidency. Uh, Zachos uh, penned various pamphlets uh, that revealed his interest in education as well as abolition, 
And he wrote some uh, very important instructional pamphlets, including uh, a reader entitled The uh, New American Speaker, uh, uh, a title uh, advertised by, by booksellers throughout the United States. Uh, he published uh, a pamphlet entitled An Appeal to the Friends of Education for the Immigrant and the Freed People of the South. And his own experience as a foreigner and his professional uh, experience in uh, educating freed slaves in uh, South Carolina, for example, during the war compelled him to believe that all those uh, ought to be taught to read as the first steps towards the higher and broader life of American institutions. He was very famous in uh, some of his educational works, in particular, again, uh, reading, uh, uh, becoming an important issue, and him teaching it uh, to, to freed slaves. He was, uh, um, he assisted uh, in, in the education of, 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 of many slaves and uh, became important actually with regards to not only the educational aspect, but also, also his speaking skills. He was one of the foremost uh, uh, speakers in the United States of America. Even though he was born in Greece, he became like one of the most famous speakers. And he spoke uh, tremendously, uh, was very famous for his speeches in particular on, on abolition. Uh, I can go on and on, but I'm not going to. I will just point out two more aspects that uh, are very important, not people, uh, but actually relate to the Greek Revolution. And they happen to be, in, in uh, one particular case, it happens to be a statue. So if you can go to the next, uh, the next statue. Okay. This statue is called the Greek Slave. And probably one of the foremost and most famous statues. We don't talk about it today. But this was one of the most famous statues ever brought into the United States of America. And it was by uh, Hiram Powers, who was the, uh, an American sculptor. And uh, he, it was, uh, it was a, a statue that, that traveled around America and became very famous. Uh, it, it, it was about 1840 that this took place, but it became very famous because this was a statue of a Greek slave that was in the slave markets of Constantinople and was being sold. And again, this created a very huge stir within, within the population of the United States because here they saw someone who was not, who was not African-American or black, but someone who was white that was being sold in the slave markets. And it didn't take much to figure out or to connect the dots to figure out like, why do we have slavery in the United States? So this particular statue again uh, is uh, now at the, uh, I believe at the Smithsonian. People don't talk about it much, but one of the most important statues uh, of America. Uh, uh, a copy of a statue did uh, travel to, uh, did travel to, uh, uh, to England and uh, that produced something in the English papers that if you can go to the next slide, uh, you, will, you will see. So, in the English papers, uh, someone came out with this uh, cartoon, the Virginia slave. So as the Greek slave was traveling, somebody came out with uh, the Virginia slave and said, and the comparison became obvious to the discussion, not only that we're having today, but also uh, some of the rhetorical tools that were used by the abolitionists uh, during the uh, abolitionist period of the United States. With that, I apologize again for taking for taking too long, and uh, I would like to uh, to introduce our next presenter. Uh, it is our uh, our honor. It is our honor to uh, for me and my honor personally uh, to introduce Professor Herb Boyd, a good friend, uh, who will talk about the global reach of the Black abolitionist movement. Uh, Herb uh, Boyd is an award-winning author and journalist who has published a number of books and countless articles for national magazines and newspapers. His recent book is Black Detroit, A People's History of Self-Determination, which has received several awards, including a finalist for the NAACP Image Award. Among his other books are The Diary of Malcolm X, First Battle and Victory, uh, hold on, hold on, <laughs> my apology. 
My apology, Herb. Uh, among his other books are The Diary of Malcolm X, uh, co-edited with Malcolm X's daughter. And uh, by any means necessary, Malcolm X, not invented, uh, co-edited uh, with Dr. Uh, Haiki Madhabuti, uh, Dr. Uh, Ron Daniels, and uh, Dr. Me Melana Karenga. Brotherhood Odyssey of Black Men in America, an anthology co-edited with uh, Robert Allen of the Black Scholar Journal, uh, which won the uh, American Book Award for nonfiction. He has been inducted into three Hall of Fames, including the National Association of Black Journalists and the International Literary Hall of Fame for Writers of African Descent. Herb is a graduate of Wayne State University, teaching African-American history and culture at the City College of New York in Harlem, where he lives. Uh, Herb, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Lewis. One of the things that, um, and Dan, you know this very well, uh, when we have a, a dinner down in Greek town in Detroit, yep. at the restaurants there, which is a <laughs> fantastic street of these fabulous restaurants, all of specializing in, in Greek cuisine. Well, after getting a meal brought to you, we fire that sucker up. And the words out of that follow that is that oompa, oompa. And that's what I have to say about your presentation, Lewis and Professor Alexo. I mean, my, hey, Bill, tell Bill, I got my, he's got his United Armor. I got my Black Mamba here, right? You know? <laughs> okay, Bill. It's such a pleasure to, to be with you, Lewis, and see how you've uh, assembled what I call um, Michigan, you know, bringing Dan and I together again. Of course, we, as you suggested earlier, we've spent so many years together on the activist front, the literary front, the academic front. He's all, he's a very versatile scholar and I can wait, I, I can't wait to hear from him. Um, to say nothing of New York and having my, my brother, by another mother, you know, Lloyd Williams here. He's my, really my chief, he's my chief, he's my boss. And I just admire him so much because he's always looking out for me. In fact, he's helped me pretty busy this weekend uh, to say nothing of this whole concern about uh, the 56th uh, celebration or anniversary or commemoration, whatever you want to call it in terms of losing uh, Malcolm X or El Haj Malik El Shabazz, uh, taken by assassinators at the Audubon Ballroom in Washington Heights, the 21st on a Sunday, a Sunday. So all of these things, you know, have this interesting conjunction, this confluence of stuff. And I just tore up my lecture. I uh, just, you don't need to, you don't need to hear this. <laughs> it would be redundant. Uh, after listening to you, Lewis, and and and, and uh, Professor Alexu, particularly on James Williams, who I feel is um, the epitome of what I was talking about in terms of the global reach, you know, of the African American abolitionist movement in this country. It's so much to be said about the abolitionist movement, and you've incorporated that in your discussion. You know, to hear the names, some of the names I research going over Maureen's. I didn't read Maureen's book. I read her PhD dissertation, which is online. It's a fantastic piece of scholarship. And I was glad to see that that was done at George Mason University back in 2014. And I certainly applaud the fact and support that whole initiative in terms of bringing it to a wider audience. Because it, if anything, it's called the Greek Fire. You held the book up there, and and it deals with the the whole Greek War for Independence, and the whole emergence of the the American Reform uh, movement in this country from 1780 down to the uh, 1860, right to the eve of the uh, Civil War in this country. How wonderful to see some of the members 
and some discussion about the secret six. I have done a lot of work on the life and legacy of John Brown. And one of the things that's often missing in the discussion about John Brown and that raid on Harper's Ferry, this government arsenal, is the five black men who rode with him, including Anderson Osborne. Osborne Anderson is probably the most significant one for me because he survived it and wrote about it. The whole voice, the voice from Harper's Ferry. And what Maureen does in her book, and it's good, she, the kind of scholarship that she brings to this here and digging into the situation, not only about the white abolitionists, but a few of the African-American abolitionists. What you talked about earlier, Lewis, in terms of Freedom's Journal, that's an important journal that comes into existence at the same time that slavery is being eliminated here in the state of New York almost the same year. You talk about 1827, 1826. That was a very, very important conjunction of years there. And the two editors of Freedom's Journal, which is considered the first African-American publication, was uh, Samuel Cornish and John Russworm. Eventually they have a parting of ways, but at some point they were on the same page, particularly in, uh, on the Freedom's Journal. There were a number of articles in Freedom's Journal about the whole Greek struggle for independence against the Ottoman Turks. And the comparison made by some of those writers there, and then David Walker is gonna go and take it even to another level of comparison and to castigate this US government who spent so much time and interest and dealing with Greek independence and say nothing about the liberating African-American people in this country. That was a point that David Walker made repeatedly in his appeal. Interestingly enough, that comes out in 1829, 1830, and then almost a year after this publication, you have the mysterious death of David Walker. They're trying to pull that together in the same way we're trying to understand the assassinations of President Kennedy, Dr. King, say nothing of Malcolm X. In fact, in today's paper, there's an article that began to pick up on the possibility of reopening that case. But nonetheless, you know, you're talking about the, the Civil War period, the 1820s, from 1820 to 1860, if you had to carve off 40 years of American history, those would be, a, that'd be a critical insight to pick it up from what was happening in 1821 in Greece and what was happening in this country in the 1820s down to the start of the Civil War because the height of the economy was the cotton production. The whole employment without any compensation, the back breaking work you know, of, of blacks who were brought from Africa, essentially to do that kind of labor. 1860 then, you know, you have this year, what you may call the accumulation of capital and what the, what the slavery movement was all about in terms of the eradicating that. And you talked about William Lord Garrison, who is a very in interesting individual in terms of his publication was called The Liberator. I just did a piece so that will be coming out to, uh, next week in the Amsterdam News on David Ruggles. David Ruggles was an important abolitionist, anti-slavery fighter right here in New York City, down in where, with the, oh, I guess St. John Street and William Street, that's where Olympus are, that's where he was located. When Frederick Douglass escaped from bondage, he came straight to New York. And one of the individuals that helped facilitate his uh, arrival and make sure he was secured was David Ruggles. Not enough is said about David Ruggles, not enough is said about the Reverend Dr. W. J. W. C. Pennington, the fugitive blacksmith. He was kind of ensconced over in Har uh, Brooklyn, but nonetheless very much involved with the anti-slavery movement in this country. 
they were affiliated with Wendell Phillips and William Lloyd Garrison, you know, those individuals, these white abolitionists. It's good to see you talked about Julia Howe and the whole Battle Hymn of the Republic and Samuel Gridley Howe, the whole Secret Six, all those individuals, they kind of percolate and resonate around the activism of John Brown. But, but keep in mind, we talk about John Brown, don't forget those five black men who rode with him because little or no attention is given to John Brown. And when it is, it's a lot of misinformation and, scan and very scandalous you know, repudiation and calling him insane and crazy because he was involved with the emancipation of black people in this country. Well, that's the kind of insanity we need. You know, and he, he was very much, he was a devout individual, totally committed in the same way as some of the other rebellions that we've had. There's a, a new book by two, edited by two emerging scholars. I should say emerged because after this book, it's called 400 Souls. And they brought together 90 writers, 80 writers and 10 poets. And each have given assignment to deal with about a five year period over the whole 400 years of enslavement and, and suppression and oppression in this country. And one of the assignments I had was to talk about the rebellion of 1712. In the same way I was doing research on Maureen's book in anticipation of this moment, you find that this here revolt feeling in the 1820s, and that's where you can see this association between the, the Greek independence movement and how the uh, anti-slavery movement in this country is a beneficiary you know, of the Greek uprising. There's a connection there. And David Walker was very good in making that connection. William Lord Garrison through the Liberator, he was good about doing it. And, and he was very, very conscious about bringing black writers aboard in his publication. Frederick Douglass was one of his primary uh, uh, writers, editors at the Liberator. Eventually they parted the company in the same way that uh, I guess Douglass kind of took a step away from John Brown because of the whole militant radicalism that he brought in play. But all that was part and parcel of the kind of struggle that was evolving and taking place in Greece at that time. So you can see the, inter the interconnection there. You know, I was just uh, looking at uh, some of the notes that I had gathered uh, to talk about uh, the role of uh, James Williams well, that's been anticipated. <laughs> I thought, Alexio, you did a good job there. You know, prior to this meeting, it's much like my situations in the classroom, Lewis. I learned more from my students than I could ever impart. They bring all of this information in, in the classroom. Some of them are not even aware how they're teaching me. And such has been this experience. You know, just listening to the discussion here and what's to come, it's so edifying. It just makes you want to dig back into it because this is just, we just turn the turf. You got to do a deep dive into this stuff and bring it up with some of the other significant moments that have been either obscured or overlooked, pushed aside or never pursued, never pursued. And this, this begins to broaden the discussion and connect us up in the same way that you brought me and Lloyd and Dan and Bill to say nothing of uh, Nicholas, bring us together so we can have a better understanding of the conjunction of these particular aspects of, of struggle, the commonalities that we have that have not been really delved into enough to see that there's even more jewels, a lot more of interest, a lot more significant developments that we need to understand as we push for total liberation. That's what the uh, Greek uh, struggle was about in 1821. That's what the African-American uprisings, you can go back and look at all of the uh, Nat Turner's thing. Hmm? In 1831, just 10 years after the Greek uprising, the Greek struggle for independence. Go back to 1800 and look at uh, Gabriel Prosser, 
You know, you look at uh, Denmark, D.C. These are in their Cato out of Stono. The great scholar, Herbert Aftiker, he put together what called the American Negro Slave Revolts. He counted 250 uprisings. Many of them were stimulated by other struggles. It was good to hear you talk about Haiti in terms of 1804. You know, that revolution is primary for a number of other revolutionary uprisings. That's a centerpiece. That's the germ of it all. And you can see how many people picked up on the coast. These black people, you know, can struggle for their independence successfully as Toussaint Louverture and Dessalines and King Christophe and Mackendall. These individuals out, these legendary individuals from Haiti can beat back the powers of Europe. Anything is possible. But the inspiration from that, you know, they set in motion something that the Greeks picked up on and then extended it right on to the continuation of our struggle for, for independence and freedom in this country. What's the word in Greek for freedom? Epitria. Thank you very much. <laughs> Herb, Herb, thank you, thank you for that. I, I also had, uh, I also had read uh, Maureen's uh, dissertation, and as a matter of fact, when we had her on uh, on that event that I mentioned, which was in December, when I called her and told her, "Listen, uh, you know, I want you to be on this particular event relating to uh, uh, Hellenic and Philhellenic women and their effects on the revolution." Uh, she said the time, and I said, where is your book? She said, the timing is absolutely spectacular because <laughs> it's the same week, the same week we came something. out with that event was, 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 her, was her book. I, I think, and I agree with you, that, uh, that we have to jump back and start looking at the history a little bit closer. I, I found it with a lot of these events that we're having, the, the history is there. The history is there. Mm -hmm. we, just, we just have to go dig into it. You gotta dig. In, in other words, what you brought up, for example, right now, where you talked about from 1820 to 1860, for someone to zero in on that time period and do, for example, a comparison would be would be like spectacular. I think I, I think it would I think it would get you the, the 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 prize for the for the best book in the United States. Quite frankly, uh, there's not enough of that. And, and thank you so much for, for the kind words. And uh, it's, really, it's really great to have this group here today because we're almost, we're almost like rediscovering stuff, you know, amongst ourselves. So it's, it's wonderful. Thank you again, Herb. Uh, I'd like uh, to introduce now our, uh, our uh, last presenter, but uh, someone who's extremely, extremely well-known uh, in our in our community, uh, it's uh, Dan, uh, Professor Dan Georgiakis, who will be speaking on human rights at the turn of the 19th century. Uh, Dan is the director of the Greek American Studies Project at the cent uh, at the Center for Byzantine and Modern Greek Studies at uh, Queens College. He is the editor of the Journal of Contemporary Hellenic Issues, and is a biweekly columnist. Uh, for the National Herald, which is the, uh, the national newspaper uh, that we have, the Greek newspaper in the United States of America. It's a daily publication. Uh, his most recent work is um, uh, My Detroit, uh, Growing Up Greek and American in Motor City. <laughs> it's a loving uh, but critical memoir of Detroit from uh, in the uh, 1950s to 1960s when it had the highest standard of living of any American metropolis. My De uh, Detroit proceeds from the industrial east side to explore Detroit's uh, complex racial, artistic, economic, and political life. It is a subjective a companion to his Detroit, to his Detroit, I do mind dying, a historical account of the city's turbulent 1960s. He is the author, editor, and co-author of a dozen titles. Uh, he has spoken about film and mass media on MTV, the History Channel, the Canadian Broadcasting System, Pacifica Radio, The Voice of America, and Greek National Television, among other radio and television outlets. Uh, Dan has taught at uh, New York University, at Columbia University, the University of Oklahoma, 
the University of, uh, of Massachusetts at Amherst and Queens College. Many of his books have been translated into French, Italian, Spanish, and Greek, or have been published in, uh, in the UK. Uh, Dan Georgiakis, welcome Dan, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here in this company. Um, a lot of details have been given so far, <clears throat> so I like, which I thought would happen. So I'd like to give a broader picture of the uh, 19th century, the turn of the 19th century, <clears throat> and how that affects both Greece and the United States. So start with the revolution of 1776. We like to talk about Jefferson and the intellectual th turmoil, um, the French Enlightenment and so forth. <clears throat> but let's remember the following, Thomas Paine was putting out pamphlets promoting those same ideas within the general public. So it wasn't a question of elitists being knowing about Greece and the Enlightenment, but the whole United States to some degree was familiar with those ideas. And the basic idea of course was self-determination, which will be my theme. Um, what people don't talk about often is when George Washington first met his army, he said, oh, there's a lot of black people here. In other mm -hmm. words, the American Revolution had huge black participation. So uh, they were not going to have somebody come and liberate them. They're going to liberate themselves. And that was the attitude of the American uh, revolutionary. Now, I don't want to over-idealize them, but they did pretty well. Uh, they established the first democracy in the, in the New World, or not the first democracy because the Indians had it too, but they established a modern state and they passionately hoped that other countries would follow. And um, the complexity of the world is uh, when Haiti followed, in 1803-4, um, we didn't respond. We didn't respond. The United States didn't respond probably because of the racism, probably because of the particular particularities of Haiti and things like that we have to look at. But the spirit of self-determination was there. In 1812, the British again attacked the United States. And again, the United States, Washington got burned, um, was able to win. And the major battle uh, was fought after the war was over, led by Andrew Jackson. Who was in that battle? He had a motley crew of uh, militia, pirates, some regular army, um, black soldiers again, uh, and they won. And that set off a whole um, trend in the United States of getting more rights for average people, the uh, Jacksonian revolution, always full of contradictions. You know, all rights for all people, all rights for all white people. Uh, so when the Greek Revolution breaks out, oh, I just thought about the French Revolution, the United States is very happy about the French Revolution, except it failed. It ended up with Napoleon in an empire instead of George Washington and a constitution. So when the Greek Revolution broke out, it seemed ideal. Here was a an army made up mainly of regular people. These were people who were not backed by big powers. Um, it was the common man taking his rifle and going out and fighting. Um, very much like the Minutemen uh, in the American Revolution. So it was an immediate, it was an immediate connection. Um, the other connection, of course, was 
all those high high ranking intellectuals like Jefferson and the rest of them had had their influence. Um, educated people spoke Greek or knew about Hellenic culture. Southern plantation owners like Greek architecture. Um, and the craze of the day was the Romantic poets. And the Romantic poets idolized Greece. And the idea was, oh my God, the United States was inspired by ancient Greece. And now modern Greece has been inspired by the United States to some degree to restore itself and speak for itself. Um, very heady stuff. Lord Byron is kind of interesting, you mentioned Lord Byron. And I'm gonna emphasize this over and over again. When Lord Byron went to Greece, he did not go there to be the boss. He went to Greece to aid the Greeks, to give them military equipment and other um, publicity and what have you, so they could free themselves. Uh, and this is, this is, I think, what so inspired the American public. This is a grassroots revolution. This is scraping up, you know, uh, whatever you could, one of the mightiest empires, well, one of the mightiest empires of its time. And here the, here's this Greek peasant going out there with his rifle and he's gonna win. Amazing, it was amazing. It thrilled people. And of course, people started looking back at the United States, what I was saying before. Once the revolution, once the American revolution was over, there were a lot of revolutionaries left over who did not like the constitution. They recognized <clears throat> that the slave owning states had way too much power. And this was not a liberal conservative issue. J John Adams, very conservative president, spoke harshly about the constitution, harshly about the electoral college, harshly about the uh, um, counting uh, five uh, black men as three white men for the purpose of voting so that the Southern states could have a bigger vote. Um, Alexander Hamilton, the banker, uh, was against, uh, uh, against slavery. Uh, whereas Thomas Jefferson, the great liberal, was, uh, had slaves. Uh, George Washington uh, wanted a withering away of, of slavery. Uh, he thought that individual slave owners should give up their slaves as it were over a period of time. And <clears throat> he's not a perfect man. He did tell lies. Uh, he did know that if you freed a slave and they were penniless and had no education, they're not gonna go anywhere. So part of his withering away was actually to prepare the slaves that were to become free men. Now the anti-slavery movement it was very complex, Herb, and all of you have talked about it, that it was contradictory. Uh, different impulses, uh, not, not, I shouldn't say contradictory, complex. What was the best way to get rid of slavery? Well, one way was trying to do legislation, okay. Long term, that didn't work. The Quakers and others, came up with the Underground Railroad, which is to say, we will allow slaves to run away, come to us and we'll put them somewhere safe. A lot of discussion is made about that. The point I want to emphasize is how dangerous it was. If you were a slave and entered the Underground Railroad, if you were caught, you were in a lot of trouble. If you were a station in the Underground Railroad, you could pay for your life. So although we think of it as a, as a, a pacifist or nonviolent movement, it's a bit like Martin Luther King's movement, that it requires the average person 
to take huge risks in order to advance the cause. Well, some uh, abolitionists didn't think this was gonna happen fast enough, legislation was gonna happen fast enough, and they also discovered something else. There was a movement to the West, mainly uh, we talk about Kansas and Missouri. White people went there to have farms, start up their farm, and they looked up and a slave owner comes by with 50 slaves. And those white farmers <clears throat> understood, we cannot compete with slave labor. So in one of those happy moments of uh, sociologically in American history, white workers turned against slavery because they realized it was better for them as well as for slaves. So that they, they, they were doing the right thing from the human rights point of view, but they were also doing something very practical. Talk about John Brown, people who uh, support him. John Brown did not invade the South to free the slaves. He went to the South to get an arsenal to have weapons so that slaves could run to the centers, arm themselves and lead their own revolution. And in that sense, you see a parallel between Lord Byron and John Brown, completely different kind of personalities, different kind of motivations, but both of them said, we want to have this, we can't free you. You can only free yourself. We know you can free yourself and we're just gonna help you. And we'll ally with, we'll ally with, we'll ally with you and, um, and we'll die with you if necessary. And of course, at Harper's Ferry, uh, turned out to be a, uh, not successful, but uh, a few years later, they'd be singing John Brown's body is the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Also want to point out, <clears throat> when we get to the Civil War, at the end of the Civil War, hundreds of thousands of Blacks had joined the Union Army and, one re and Grant greatly uh, respected them and expected that one reason they could win any war with the South was they had even deployed most of the Black soldiers yet. So my theme here is self-determination the willingness to fight. And one of the things that I see between the Greek revolution and the abolitionists is that grassroots activism where big outside powers are minimal and individual courage and initiatives are very strong. Uh, I wanna just, um, <clears throat> say two things, but you already mentioned. One was uh, Zachos, uh, who uh, became an abolitionist, an or, uh, one of the orphans became an abolitionist. At the end of the Civil War, he set up a school in which he trained, which he educated 400 black uh, slaves for freed men because he wanted to prove that given education, they're certainly capable of being part of uh, the United States. He also wrote a handbook, which was referred to, which was written for people who were new immigrants coming to the United States uh, who didn't speak English. So there, that's how complex it gets. You wanna go back, um, to the American Revolution itself, one of the uh, no power uh, aided the American Revolution except the French at the end. Uh, but many individual immigrants came. One of the most interesting was von Steuben, who was, by the way, had a fake name. He wasn't, he wasn't really a royalty, he was just a regular soldier. Uh, who became the most important um, 
drill master uh, for Washington. He, had, he was gay. He was openly gay. So when we talk about the gay military being integrated sexually and uh, racially, well, go back to the American Revolution. Uh, pretty good start right there. Um, of course, some of those traditions were lost. I also want to point out that other um, immigrants who came, like Pulaski and Kosciuszko and others, represented independence movements in Central Europe. So you have this um, international sense of self-determination. Um, it's very hard to put your finger on it. It's very complex. Uh, it's not uh, individuals, any, any individual may have contradictions and what have you, but the theme of this whole period is self-determination, full rights, hate to say it, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Jefferson got that right. He got that right. Last point about the slave. There are actually uh, the slave statue. Um, there are actually six of them. And we're talking about uh, the 1840s. There's no radio, there's no television. So one of the entertainments of the day was for people to go to art galleries and then read, read articles about what was in the art gallery. So when this statue uh, uh, began to be shown, it became a, uh, a focus for human rights, uh, women's rights, and the last version of the statue has chains on it that were modeled against the chains that are in the American South. So it was a very explicit uh, suggestion. Uh, that statue was seen by hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, it's, it's hard to grasp that, but it's, it's like, a movie or that really makes a big impact. Um, so my conclusions or my, what I wanna to add to the conversation is let's not always think of the individuals. None of them are perfect, but if you look at the mass of people in action, the abolitionists were never a majority but they were righteous, firm in what they were doing, and they believed in self-determination. They did not believe in authoritarianism where some elite group comes in and tells you what to do. And that's a great contribution of the Greeks, and it's a great contribution of the abolitionist movement, and uh, I'd like to see more of it. <laughs> Dan, Dan and everyone, thank, thank you so much. I, I'd just like to open up the discussion, if, if we can, uh, Herb and Dan, since you've both <laughs> written books on, the, on, on your Detroit, can, can, you, can you just elaborate a little bit about Detroit? Because obviously it has brought you guys together. And uh, if, if you have some words on that, I'm, I'm very interested in that. And also your linkage, because obviously you've known each other for a long time. Well, Herb, you're the, you're the historian of the city. Why don't you start off <laughs> we, I think the first I heard of you Dan was from an ex-girlfriend <laughs> <laughs> a very fine singer named Nettie Glenn oh there's a photo is I think it's in your book yeah it's, it's in your book yeah is a photo of her, I guess you, one of those performance photos. Yeah. And you included her in there because of your connection to that particular location. I'm not sure, you have to yeah. elaborate on that. You, you, you took something good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but then I think the most important- So who's yes. at girlfriend? 
Who's ex girlfriend? <laughs> Not mine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Lloyd, what this Dan was one of the his book, Detroit, I Do Mind Dying, is a classic. An absolute classic that he did with uh, Marvin Serkin. And they brought back the, was uh, an edition of that? Third in which edition. Manning Mirable was involved, I was involved, yeah. and some of the other writers, you know, who were active at that time in Detroit, which was like a, a fever pitch in terms of, of activism and revolutionary fervor. I mean, Wayne State University, well, Dan, you know, you go back to Wayne State too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let me talk about that uh, photograph. <laughs> there, was a, there was a magazine called On the Town. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a black enterprise, black ownership, black editors and so forth. Um, and at that time, I wanted to have a connection with black culture but I wanted it to be natural. I wanted it to be uh, me, uh, not telling people what to do, but working with people, learning from them and so forth. So I was one of two writers of that magazine that were white. And um, the idea was, it was a little magazine. It had about nightclubs in it. It was, it was such a, it had a, uh, split personality. Half of it was about nightclubs, jazz, et cetera, et cetera. And the other half was about James Baldwin, <laughs> Martin Luther King, et cetera. And the idea was to sell it, which we did, uh, in nightclubs, in popular places, to a Black audience, but hopefully eventually to... Uh, bring over a mixed audience. And there are all kinds of things going on in Detroit at that time. We had the first integrated theater uh, mm -hmm. in the sense of uh, Woody King and uh, uh, the Unstable. Theater. It was a theater, yeah. And yeah. Um, we performed black uh, writers, we performed white writers. Uh, and uh, it was in fact a pretty, equal situation in the sense that we get together and talk, who should we, what play should we do next? And <laughs> it might come from, from anybody. Uh, and, uh, and so one of the things I was trying to do in all those years was find, I'm Greek. They always call me Greco. Everybody, no, nobody ever thought I was trying to be a black man or play something like that. But I wanted to connect with the most dynamic culture in the city. And I wanted to connect in a natural way. And so that's why I got involved in a lot of these art uh, situations and what have you. And of course, we haven't mentioned the uh, revolt in the factories, which we both were, uh, neither of us are factory workers, but we got close to those guys and worked with them as well as we could. And um, again, it was, a, I would say this, uh, people talk about Detroit to do my dying. And they say, uh, well, how, how is it this white guy write this book about black revolutionaries? Well, I had, <laughs> I had known those guys for 10 years. And when the, when the time came uh, where they were making great inroads in the city, um, I said, you got to write about, you got to write this story up. This is this got to be out, put out. And they said, we haven't got time to do any writing. We're too busy making social change. You'd write it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the reason why they could trust me was I had actually had this long relationship. It wasn't like, I'm coming in with a, a hot shot and say, oh, I'll be here for a month, get all the information, write a book. Um, and what I like to see is a greater organic connection between uh, whites in general 
but since uh, we're talking about the Greek American community, uh, I'd like to see a better connection or a closer connection uh, between the uh, black movement and Greek Americans. It's as simple as that. <laughs> Dan, 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 I love that theme. And as a matter of fact, when you guys were talking, I, I, Lloyd and Bill, can you unmute yourselves? As, as, you, as you guys were talking, I, yes. was think, I was thinking of, of exactly, exactly what you're talking about. In other words, here we are, the 200th anniversary. Here we are discussing the connections. Why can't we uh, increase those connections, actually, with Greece itself? Yes. Now, now Lloyd, Lloyd and the Harlem Chamber and, and Emka, every, every year, except in the last year or so, we've been doing uh, Harlem Blues, Hellenic Blues concerts together. <laughs> and uh, the concerts have been great because, as you know, the blues and the rebetica are the Greek blues. Okay, so it, it's the same, the same type of thing, different, different, but same type of aspect. So, what I, Bill, what I, and, and Lloyd, what I would like to get out of this uh, is a, a connection with our communities and Greece itself, Bill. In other words, in other words, why can't we connect uh, Harlem with uh, with Athens or or some other city? In, in Greece, why can't we do more events that relate around this particular topic that Dan brought up? And in fact, this relationship that goes back a long time, it goes back a long time, we've forgotten it, okay? Yeah. Maureen maybe wrote about it because she went, she went into the literature and started pulling it out, but we've forgotten it. And I think, I think we have to bring it back, in, in my opinion. I think there's a lot to be gained from this uh, obviously, it brings in other organizations, too. I mean, we haven't talked about it, nor are we going to talk about it. But, for example, HEPA, which was founded in, uh, in 1922, it had, it had to do with the KKK, for example. It was founded, it was founded in Atlanta, Georgia, where the, uh, the Grand Wizard or whatever he was of the KKK was located uh, because of, of bias, etc., there's a link that we haven't explored in, uh, in my opinion. I think this conversation has been, um, has been very, very interesting. We go back in order sometimes to go forward. So um, I'd like to hear some of your thoughts. I don't know if anybody has thoughts on what I just said. Well, you know what? Uh, yes. Let's do it. Are you uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's, uh, let's stop talking about it. Let's do it. Lewis. <laughs> You sit on the uh, board of the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce on the executive board, as does the uh, president of the New York State NAACP, Hazel Dukes. I mean, uh, they, we're right there. So uh, uh, without saying much more, let's do it. I think that's yeah, great. Bill? Bill? It's, uh, very you're coming broken up, Bill. Yes. I mean, Lou, I, gentlemen, what I heard today, I'm really impressed. I said to you guys, gentlemen, Lou, I'm really so excited. But you guys are working library. I love what we can do. And this is a fantastic idea. Not only, not only New York, we can uh, sister cities, number of cities with ethnic number part of Greece. This is unbelievable what I heard today. And I thank you for it. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, everyone. Anyway, let's let's do some closing remarks if we can. This is a great conversation. I hope we continue it. We, uh, we want to start with Nico. Nico, you want to make some closing remarks? Yes, uh, uh, the two uh, hundred year anniversary of, of uh, the Greek War of Independence uh, and um, thinking about the contribution or the connection with. Uh, uh, the abolition uh, movement are, are very important. And once more, uh, unfortunately, uh, th th there are still contemporary issues. Uh, and, and, and I think uh, with a new energy and uh, uh, a new vocabulary and new action, uh, we should complete the demands of the, of the revolution and the demands of the uh, abolition uh, movement. Yes. Thank you, Nico Herb. I think what uh is significant about this moment is that uh, the inspiration we can draw from it and, and a certain kind of obligation I feel as a scholar because um, Malcolm 
the only time Malcolm really talked about the Greeks, he invoked the name of Herodotus. <laughs> and he took Herodotus to task. <laughs> <laughs> and saying that uh, in terms of his history, and of course many other scholars have, have admitted that there was a number of inaccuracies there. I mean, yeah. but You're that's generous. to be expected. We started writing something down particularly at that time when Herodotus, but he, what, what Malcolm was saying was that Herodotus should have given a little bit more attention to his uh, predecessors, who his, who his teachers were. In the same way of, of Socrates and Aristotle and Plato, in terms of the, the primacy of, um, of comedic culture, the primacy of Egyptology. And, and so that's the point that Malcolm was trying to make. You know, come on, you cannot just throw us com coming full blown out of slavery mm -mm. and looking at the, all the dynasties in Africa. So my point is this, I think it's uh, incumbent when we begin to dig into what did Du Bois have to say about any of this? Was there a connection, some intersection in his thinking and his work in terms of the Greek independence movement. You know, what some of the other, the, the John Hope Franklins, the Dr. John Henry Clarks, the Dr. Ben Yusuf Yakanan. I mean, what do these individuals have to say about that? Some of it, of course, is not very admirable. Some of it is very dismissive, but then that's part of it. You know, we need to bring it all to the table, the good, the bad, and the absolute ugly. <laughs> But I think that's incumbent on me as a scholar to begin to find deeper associations, very meaningful, significant moments in terms of what the confluence of African-American history and culture and our Greek compatriots. You like that word, Dan, compatriots. I love it, I love it. <laughs> Dan, some closing remarks? Well, uh, I, I, I <clears throat> like the direction of this conversation. I'd like to point out, for instance, turn of the century, when the uh, sponge divers came to Florida, uh, there was a conflict between the, the Greek immigrants coming in and the native sponge divers, which got very ugly. I mean, at shootings and what have you, uh, boats being burned, uh, Ku Klux Klan, cops, etc., on the non-Greek side. The Greeks needed workers and they hired blacks to work with them. This is the deep South Florida, 1905. Here's what I think is really astounding. The pay given to the black workers was on the same scale as the Greek worker. In other words, a cook got so per, so, such a percentage of the sponge divers, the uh, rower got another percentage and so forth. And the uh, blacks became part of that group. In other words, you got paid by not your color, but what your job was. And the, uh, as time went on, the, uh, some of the uh, African-Americans were able to get their own ships went out sponge diving with the Greeks um, and had a, uh, a cordial relationship. Uh, many uh, African-Americans uh, in Tarpon Springs spoke Greek. So there are those kind of moments that we have to look at and say, how is that possible? And how can we replicate it now in the 21st century? And uh, I think there is something in Greek culture that is uh, welcoming of strangers. I, 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 I kind of changed the Greek word around to xenophilia. Instead of xenophobia, <laughs> sometimes they have xenophilia. They, they like strangers. Uh, mm -hmm. And or strangers, people who are not of their of their uh, country, uh, and we we have some cultural 
um, advantages that we can take care of, that we can um, work on. Many Greeks were from Asia Minor. So when we first came to the United States in the 1900s, the American government called us Asians. There was a, for the period, it was, Greeks were not Europeans, they were Asians. Those same sponge divers had um, business connections in Egypt, North Africa, et cetera, et cetera. So we've got a, a rich tradition and some uh, recent scholarship has come up about Greek diner owners and Greek confectionery owners in the South in the 60s who supported the, the uh, Black Liberation Movement. And uh, as a scholar, that's kind of stuff I want to dig in and move it from anecdotal to statistical, et cetera, et cetera. So we're not starting at zero. And of course, we always we can talk about Iacov some other time because that's a complicated question. But he did march, <laughs> and and let's let's say this. However, you may feel about him. This was a guy who was almost seven feet tall. He's going to have a black robe. He's going to have this beard. He's going to be in the front row. If you're going to shoot anybody. He's the perfect target, and he's actually, quote, an outside agitator. So there's a lot to be think about the archivist marching in Selma. Uh, Bill, some, fi some <clears throat> final comments, Bill? My final comment, it's a question in the comments. I'm really, like I said, you guys are unbelievable, but I was thinking, listen to all you guys, gentlemen, and I was thinking how all these things can the rest of the world, the rest of the United States population hear these things? Because people do not know this stuff. And that's the idea, because you guys, I mean, these things nobody really knows. The struggle that the African-Americans went through, the Greeks went through, and all these people went through. And all, you know, a lot of similarities. How can we get it out for people to know? Because we are contributing to this society in the different ways. And we're part of the society. We didn't come yesterday. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, it's up to us, as Lloyd would say, to uh, to get the message out. Lloyd, some final words? Uh, real quick, uh, Nicholas, miss you. Look forward to seeing you uh, in person as soon as possible. Uh, Bill, uh, let's... Uh, take advantage of the opportunity and let's find a way to strengthen that which we are doing um, and let's partner. Um, the uh, the um, Herb, you, uh, you have spoken to me for years about Dan and this is my first opportunity to meet Dan and uh, thank you Herb, I now understand what you've been speaking to me about for a long time. Dan, honored to meet you and, and, and really uh, pleased to hear what you have to say. Uh, one, this is one other comment is that, uh, as Herb knows, one of the persons uh, who was a massive mo a movement leader for uh, uh, Black people uh, who uh, was always uh, saying uh, great things about the, the Greek uh, revolution. Uh, the Hellenic revolution was Honorable Marcus Garvey. Mm -hmm. And uh, Marcus would speak uh, very fondly and proudly of that and uh, the connections that we ought to establish uh, with the Greek community. And in closing, uh, uh, Lou, um, I, you really don't know what you're doing <laughs> in terms of building bridges. Uh, bridges that are going to last long past any of us uh, and that are part of this, uh, that you are you're spreading uh, the history, you're spreading the truth, you're bringing the cultures together. Uh, and, uh, and I just want to tell you, you know I love you, but how proud I am of you and, and uh, that what you do and wherever you are, I'll be honored to be with you.
Thank you so Thank much, you. Lloyd. Thank you so much, Lloyd. And to the, and to the audience uh, for our, our events, uh, please go on the internet uh, at embca.com, embca.com. Uh, for those uh, uh, people who are interested in Hellenism, uh, please join AHEPA, and you can go on the internet at ahepa.org. Uh, for those who are interested in many, many things, please join the uh, Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce, uh, one of the uh, most fantastic chambers in the United States of America, and probably the most, uh, the busiest chamber, the most active chamber in, in the United States. And also for, uh, for our uh, Hellenic viewers in Greece, for example, uh, please join, and in America, please join hands with the Hellenic American National Council. Thank you all for being uh, here today. For, uh, for, for, I'm, I'm sorry, for more information on the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce, please visit greaterharlemchamber.com. Thank, thank you. For, thank, Lou, and, and the HellenicAmericanProject.org. Okay, okay, say it again, the Hellenic American Project.org. Yes, okay. HAPSource.org, uh, yeah, it, it is uh, the history of, of Greek immigration where we include a lot of, of the issues uh, regarding the African American products, uh, of course. Uh, uh, I, and uh, I also uh, propose something we discussed with Lord and you uh, I, in the past uh, to do something about uh, uh, Johnny Otis. Yeah. Oh, ab no, absolutely. No, no, we'll do, we'll do an event. We'll absolutely who, do an event. Who, who, who really uh, 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 identify with African-American culture and music. Yeah. Well, mo most people think he's black. <laughs> and, and as a matter of fact, he felt black, but he was, uh -huh. he was Greek. Johnny obviously was Yanni. But anyway, uh, Bill, thank you so much for joining thank us. You. Lloyd, thank you, thank so, you much. so much for, for joining us. Uh, Nico, thank you. Uh, Herb, thank you. And Dan, thank you. Thank you to the audience. And uh, let's keep it up. Let's listen to some of the words that came out of this and let's do something about it. Thank you again, guys. Thanks. Thanks. Take care. Thanks.